Today, uh, we're very honored to uh, present to you Lanford Wilson, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, and Marshall Mason, award winning director. Our moderator for today's program is John Lyon. John is the associate uh, senior program director, rather, for uh, the American College Theater Festival here at the Kennedy Center. So would you please join me in welcoming Lanford Wilson, Marshall Mason, and John Lyon. Uh, thanks so much. It's a, a very nice feeling sitting up here with uh, two folks that I've known for some time. Don't say how long. No. Not, not, not saying how long. I want to give you just a little bit uh, more background on, uh, on each of them. Uh, Lanford, as you have heard, of course, has uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for uh, Tally's Folly. His other plays uh, also include uh, Balm and Gilead, Rhymers of Eldridge, Hot El Baltimore, Angels Fall, Burn This, many others, names that we associate instantly with the American theater. With uh, Marshall, he was a co-founder of Circle Repertory Theater, which is one, certainly one of the preeminent American theaters, regional, even though it's in New York, uh, devoted to developing new works and new playwrights. Uh, Marshall Mason, a, a, a co-founder of Circle Repertory Theater, is also a director and author, producer in his own right, and has been uh, associated with an astonishing 22 Tony nominations. He's directed 13 or 14 plays on Broadway. Uh, in addition, he's received uh, awards from the Outer Critics Circle and uh, just about every other award you could uh, name for a, a director. So we're indeed fortunate to have uh, both of them with us today. And um, I'm just going to open it up by asking some uh, uh, questions, and then later on, we'll be throwing it uh, open for questions uh, from the audience. So my first question to you is, uh, how did you meet and how did Circle Repertory form? <laughs> You go with that one. <laughs> How's that? I go with that one? Sure. Uh, I always think that's your question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was li uh, Marshall had moved to the village I, I, from uh, Chicago. I moved to the village from Chicago about a year, two years later. And uh, we were working off, off Broadway at the Cafe Chino and Cafe La Mama and finally bumped into each other one day. Joe Chino, uh, who uh, was the founder of the uh, Cafe Chino, was the one who introduced us. Uh, I had seen Lanford's, uh, well, his first play was a play called uh, So Long at the Fair, which has subsequently been lost. We don't have the script anymore. No script of that. No. And um, then I saw Home Free, and then I saw The Madness of Lady Bright, then I saw a Revival of Home Free, mm -hmm. and then I think it was That's at the Revival. That's when we were introduced. Yeah. Joe, he said, I saw the first Home Free, and I said, don't you think it's so much better? And the first thing he said to me was, no, I think you've ruined it. <laughs> So we started off to a uh, real start. good start. You know? Right, great, great start. Yeah. Terrific. Encouraging. Yeah. Uh, sub <laughs> subsequently, though, uh, uh, both of us had worked a, a good deal at the Cafe Chino, and, and Lanford, uh, uh, very shortly after that, as a matter of fact, within the first few months of our knowing each other, uh, one night I was wandering around the village unable to sleep, and I ran into Lanford also wandering around both the village. Both insomniacs. And um, we stopped and had a, a, a cup of hot chocolate at a Wayland's drugstore in the village. And it was around, in, in, uh, around um, Halloween, as a matter of fact, some, some time late in October. And um, he said, I've written this wonderful play called, uh, well, I don't know if you said it was wonderful. I've written this big play, big play. called uh, Balm and Gilead, and I'd like you to read it. And so I said, well, I'm not doing anything now. How about now? So I followed him back over to the Broadway Central Hotel, which uh, at that time was uh, still standing. Uh, subsequently, it fell in, um, and um, fell in and because they confiscated my typewriter. Nobody does that. <laughs> <laughs> I sat up all night and read Balm and Gilead, and I was deeply struck by it because it seemed to me a contemporary, uh, virtually a contemporary, lower depths, and I, I, on that kind of artistry, the kind of uh, you know, one of the great Russian writers might have written this play, except that one of my contemporary fellows had done it. And at the end of it, I handed it back to Lanford, deeply moved, and I said, you really need a brilliant director for this. <laughs> and uh, Lanford thought that I 
I hated it. Yeah. As a result, he, he, he complained to his friends, well, Marshall didn't care for Bond Marshall and Gilead. Hated it, yeah. And uh, so a mutual friend of ours said... Uh, had to said, be saved by a director, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a mutual friend of ours about a week later, Michael Powell, said, uh, I, I can't believe you didn't like Bomb and Gilead. Why in the world wouldn't you like it? I said, what are you talking about? I think it's the most brilliant American play I've ever read. And he said, well, Lenford said you didn't. I said, I said it needed a brilliant director. Didn't he understand I met me? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. Uh, so eventually, then we got this together. message got through to Lanford, yeah. and we and so I directed Bomb and Gilead in uh, January of 1965, Ugh. and that was our first uh, production together. Amazing. We yeah. did it at the, first at the Actors Studio, and then at uh, the Cafe La Mama. And so um, first thing at La Mama to to run two weeks, I think. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Usually it was one week. We you know we doubled our run, so That's it was right. pretty good. Yeah. It was also the first uh, full length play ever done off off Broadway. The original. And the first yeah. full length. Uh, uh, first off, off-Broadway play to be published. Yeah. So it was sort of like the beginning. Yes, terrific. And then uh, time went on, uh, things happened, and, Boy, didn't and, it. and, and, and <laughs> something called Circle Repertory Theater happened. What, what, what went on there? Well, that was uh, a number of years later, actually, uh, uh, four years later. Uh, we had continued to work off-off-Broadway at La Mama and at the Chino, uh, here and there, everywhere. and. Um, at one point, Lanford was uh, invited to go to Europe with the La Mama troupe, and he had written a play for them called Untitled Play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, uh, Rob Thurkeld, who was a member of that troupe, who was a co-founder of Circle Rep eventually, and, uh, and uh, was a good friend of mine from Northwestern. We had graduated school together. Uh, he and Lanford got together and sent for uh, Tanya Barrows and, and I to come and join them in Europe. So we went over there, and. Uh, uh, we wound up in London, where the La Mama troupe had a big success uh, for them uh, at the um, a little theater on, uh, not at, up in Notting Hill Gate. Uh, and um, the producer said, gee, it's a, it's a sh we have such a hit with this. It's a shame we don't have another play and yeah. need to do something else. And Lanford said, well, I'm a writer. And I said, well, I'm a director. We could bring something back for you. So sure enough, they invited us to come back in um, uh, April the following year to do um, Home Free and the Madness of Lady Bright. And we did that in London very successfully. Uh, and uh, I came back to, uh, to New York. Lanford was not with us when, when we did the productions in London. Uh, but we'd had this great success there. I came back to New York, and we had basically this little company that had uh, grown up over the years uh, from, from Bum and Gilead on. When we had Bomb and Gilead, there were 35 characters in the play. 35, 36, yeah. Yeah. And Lanford at, at some point nudged me in the ribs and said, you know, you really ought to keep these people together and form a company. It's such a, such a brilliant ensemble uh, piece of art. And uh, I said, oh, I'm too young to do that. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to tie myself down off, off Broadway. I'm going to be discovered and be on Broadway any minute, you know. But uh, four years later, it hadn't happened. <laughs> And uh, we had continued to work off off Broadway, which means lugging your tape recorder around from one place to another. In those days, they were big, heavy tape recorders, yeah. not like the little micro cassettes you get today. And uh, so, w when we came back from uh, from London, we basically had this informal repertory theater that we called the American Theater Project was our name. We had taken that name in order to get working papers in London. And, there was um, no American Theater Project. There was no American Theater Project. We just called ourselves that. And uh, we became a reality by virtue of the fact that the London press said, the American Theater Project is the best company in America, and stuff like that. <laughs> so we came back from, to New York with these London reviews saying that we were real. <laughs> and uh, Lincoln Center gave us the opportunity. Uh, uh, Jules Irving was running the Lincoln Center at that time. And he said, Try, come down, uh, and, and uh, we'll, we'll let you put on a play. Uh, and so we, we started uh, into production on a, <clears throat> a play by William Hoffman uh, called Spring Play. Uh, Bill and I subsequently did As Is many, many years later. And we're, we're at work on a play even as we speak uh, called Riga, which will be in New York next year. Anyway, Bill, we were working on Bill's play. And Actors Equity came in and said, no, you can't do a play with Lincoln Center. This is, they were in the middle of a negotiation. So they threw us out. And uh, so we had really no place to go and what have you. And suddenly, uh, I got a call from a, f a fellow who was um, uh, a, a, a psychiatrist. <laughs> and uh, I needed one by then. 
Um, and he, uh, Dr. Harry Lerner, said, I've got uh, located a, a uh, place up on 83rd and Broadway that uh, I'd like you to come take a look at, because I know you've got a theater and you have no, no home. And he knew, kn knew that the Lincoln Center Theater hadn't worked out for us, and so uh, he thought maybe we'd want to start at this point. He happened to call me when I was at Rob Thurkill's house, uh, and Lanford was there as well. And Tanya was, uh, as a matter of fact, was fixing, fixing his dinner, I think, yeah. or some such. So Lanford and, and Rob and I all hopped in a taxi and went uptown to 83rd and Broadway, where we saw this big uh, blue room that uh, on the second floor above a Tom McCann shoe store. Anyway, uh, I said, no, no, this isn't what we had in mind for a theater. This isn't really a theater. This is awful. And Dr. Lerner said, well, it's only $500 a month, so I'm going to take the lease on it anyway. And I said, well, if you're going to take the lease on it anyway, yeah. until we find a place, we could use it. So uh, sure enough, uh, on July 14th, 1969, uh, we threw a big party in this space, uh, Bastille Day. And uh, we invited everybody that we knew who had uh, what we thought was significant undiscovered talent and they all came to this party and uh, Rob and I stood up and said we're going to form this theater company and our ideals are uh, We had three basic ideals in mind one was that um, The theater should respond to the needs of the artists. That was the basic founding premise uh, This came on the heels of the fact that the Lincoln Center had fired uh, uh, Ilya Kazan and um, Robert Whitehead only a couple of years before and so we said, we want a theater that's not run by a board of directors, but that's run, in fact, by the artists. And the second uh, idea was that there was too much um, dissension among the various elements of the theater between uh, the director <coughs> and on the one hand, the writer on the other, and the actor on the other hand, and the designer on the other. And we wanted to see if we couldn't uh, break down some of those walls of communication and really have theater as, a, as a, 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 uh, an ensemble art. And, um, so the theater was devoted to breaking down those, those walls. And uh, the way we did it was uh, largely to have the, the playwrights all had to learn how to act, and the actors all had to write plays. And uh, we learned patience and tolerance and trust uh, in each other's uh, artistic impulses. And the third uh, element of the theater was that the theater would be made up of the people who were there, who really needed it, um, and who were there on an ongoing basis. We wanted to train the actors in terms of the classics and then make those skilled actors available to the best contemporary writers that we could find so that uh, the playwrights would have a company to write specific plays for uh, in the same sense that uh, Chekhov wrote for the Moscow Art Theater or that Moliere wrote for his company or Shakespeare for the King's Men, subsequently the King's Men, Queen's Men and uh, Lord Chamberlain's players, I think, yes, originally. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ibsen, every other great playwright just about, has written for a specific company. So this was the idea. Uh, it wasn't a new idea, but it was uh, new for New York. It uh, had been tried for a number of years, really since the group theater and the days of Clifford Odets. So um, uh, that was how we came into being. We spent the first six months uh, in workshop, uh, as I said, training the, uh, the writers all to, to act. And um, basically, we had two labs, one of which was uh, traditional approaches to the theater, and the other was experimental approaches to the theater. Because uh, uh, it was a time when Sam Shepard was beginning to write, and there were all kinds of new elements on the horizon that we wanted to be prepared for, as well as doing Chekhov and Shakespeare and, and the others. So uh, after six months, we undertook our first new play, which was the opening production was a play by David Starkweather, called, um, what was it a called? Practical a Practical Ritual to Exercise Frustration After Five Days of Rain. Uh, a play about Noah and uh, his Wonderful family. Wonderful play about Noah. Yeah, mm -hmm. a silly comedy. And um, then we followed that with two productions of three sisters that played in rotating rep, one of which was a traditional production uh, on a proscenium stage, and the other of which was a wildly experimental uh, production. First experimental checkoff I ever heard of, yeah. if there were elements of experimental checkoff before we did it. I don't know what they were. Yes. We had two A-frame ladders on stage and no props. It was done in contemporary dress. Uh, the, the lead drummer for The Loving Spoonful, uh, Joe Butler, played Vershinin. Uh, and we, we did it, and, and he did a lot of direct addresses to the audience, you know, smoking joints, saying, 
you know, imagine what it's going to be like 100 yeah. years from now, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, Worst and production of Chekhov I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. I have to say that the traditional one was the, still the best Chekhov I've ever, I've ever seen. It divided people right down the line. In exactly that way. Divided people right down the line because uh, you tended to like one or the other. Uh, the experimental one was the one that got us our first grant oh, because yeah. uh, the uh, Peg Sanford Foundation saw it and thought it was just the best thing he'd ever seen. So he didn't care for the traditional one, yeah. but uh, those of us who are sort of traditionalists like Lanford and myself, we preferred the traditional one. But in any case, they played in rotating reps, so you could you know, come one night and see uh, one kind of production and, and another see a whole different uh, audience because the main thing was the kids came, the, the 18, 19 year olds, who wouldn't have come to see Chekhov, but would come to see Joe Butler. Yeah, and you tell them they're going to sit on a pillow instead of in a chair, and they're going to come see it you know, on the floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> terrific, terrific. This was 1969. 69. Yeah. Let's leap forward in, in time a little. I, I thought it would be very interesting to hear about how you developed a collaborative association. I know that's an enormous loaded question, but even more interestingly, how did it last all this time? Well, you know, Two things. One, we had, had just, just had some wonderful examples of how not to, to form a collaborative relationship because when we met was just about a year after Kazan and, and Tennessee Williams had, had sort of gone their separate ways. And uh, I, the most exciting thing I had seen, the thing that made me know I wanted to be in the theater, I think, was uh, after I was, had already was in love with the theater, was... Uh, uh, Littlewood's production of *The Hostage* and uh, and Ben had had just wandered off into the night and uh, <clears throat> but anyway when when Marshall read uh, uh, when Marshall read *Bomb and Gilead* we didn't really talk about it for a month and I had talked to a couple of other directors about about the play and uh, they'd said the most ridiculous things in the world it didn't make any sense to me at all and Marshall finally and and I finally got together. And uh, he talked for two hours telling me, it was a month after he'd read the play once, telling me every single thing that was in that play, including why I wrote it, wrote it things that were hidden, things that, I, that no one can see. Of course, you know, you go on about that for half an hour, and says no one can see that, of course. Uh, how it's really a reflection of, of, of that day's uh, politics and, and economy, and which is why I wrote it. I thought it could have taken place on Wall Street. Uh, And when you get someone who understands what, what you can, what you're tr exactly what you're trying to do, it sort of opens your eyes. And then, then we read people forever because it was such a large cast. And, and as during the reading process, I think we began to get a, an idea of, uh, of who the other one was and what they liked. And I was very influenced by uh, by Marshall's directing techniques and, 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 and the exercises that we did. We went on field trips. He had, we had some actors that were really very artificial actors. They're not like the actor's studio. They're not like actors that I like necessarily, but they're very good. It's just that it's a different style and it would look rather strange in this. And Marshall broke them down in ways where they fit into the company. And just watching that process, that rehearsal process was, was a, uh, of, of uh, 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 a seminal experience for me. It was just very, very important to my later work, I think. And, uh, and once you find someone like that who understands your work, and then the next one he understood also, so it looked like we were writing, you know, I was his writer, he was my director. One of the things that, that Lanford has mentioned uh, in other uh, forum, forums uh, is, uh, has to do with, with when you at the first rehearsal, when, when I broke down the script to say, oh, these God, are the yeah. beats uh, that we will rehearse. You know, I broke it down into small, small beats to, to rehearse. And Lanford was amazed because... I would go ahead looking for the next one and find it, and he would nail it every single time. Sometimes in the middle Once of a paragraph. Once in the middle of a sentence. Once in the <laughs> middle of a sentence. Enormous uh, natural simpatico, then. Yeah. Yes, yes I think so. Uh, you know, uh, the first yeah, play I, I ever that. directed was, uh, was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof when I was 19. And I, uh, and I had grown up sort of, you know, on Tennessee Williams, as it were. But as much as, uh, as I loved his work, there was, for me, it was, it was a, a little bit more sometimes than I needed. I wanted to cut Tennessee. I wanted to trim him down. I wanted him to be more succinct because uh, 
the, the, the poetry of the language sometimes became a little bit overwhelming uh, in my, to, to my artistic sensibility. And this was certainly no problem with, with Landford's work because he was a leaner poet, but also very much the, the uh, musician uh, of the, of the uh, ear uh, and of, of dialogue, the way people really, really speak. And, and, and yet, it isn't the way people really speak. It's, it's the way people really speak you know, done as music. And it's, uh, it's a lovely, lovely thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I responded very much to, to that. And uh, I found that the other thing was that Lanford had such a tremendous uh, devotion to realistic acting. He really liked things to be real and literal on stage and not just uh, actory and phony and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the way things were often done in those well, days. I think I'd, I'd just eaten the fervent years the fervent whole. Years. I just yeah. swallowed it whole. And so I was very into the and and also Stanislavski's book. So I was I was very prepared for this for this kind of thing. I'd, I had uh, become a member. I guess were you a member of the Actors Studio mm -hmm. too? We we were both members of the Actors Studio about a year before we really got together. And so I wanted to know what the Moscow Art Theater had been like. So I read all of that, all, all of the background of the of the Actors Studio. What what happened to keep you going? Surely you must have had uh, hurdles to overcome at certain points. Well, I think, you know, I think the company was an important uh, aspect of that because, because uh, we kept having new actors and different actors to, for Lanford to write for. He would, he would get inspired by, uh, you know, uh, Nancy Snyder, and, and for uh, a year or two he would write plays for Nancy Snyder, and then it would be Trish Hawkins, or yeah. actually I've got them in reverse order, yeah, Trish, Trish and Hawkins and, Nancy and the Nancy, and, and then Bill Hurt, and Bill Hurt and for a while, and, you know, so forth. So, it was the, the, the new people coming into the company, joining us uh, along the and way. We brought Jeff Daniels into the company, mm -hmm. and immediately wrote 5th of July with, with Jeff in mind. Right. Bill Hurt had just joined the company, so I had Bill Hurt and Jeff Daniels to write for. And that was, and, and uh, a little guy that, that I had found or that I'd seen in another play, Danton Stone, and so Marshall would say, do you really think Danton Stone can do this? I got the character from Danton Stone. I saw a little moment. I know he can do it, you know. Uh, just one tiny, it was uh, in a play called uh, Mrs. Murray's Farm. Someone comes, it's like Cinderella, you know, go upstairs and do the something, go downstairs and do this. You can do them both together, Cinderella. Someone said, do this, and someone else said, do that, and left, and he goes, uh, and someone else starts talking, but in that one little moment was an entire character. Wes Hurley. Wes Hurley, and I said, he can go uh, 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 better than anyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and he, so, you know, of course he read it fabulously. He did come up to Marshall after the first reading and say, is Lanford under the impression that I play the guitar? Because I said, yes. And he says, that's okay. That's okay. And so he went out and learned how to I'll play learn. the guitar. Yeah, yeah. I'll learn. Yeah. I'll learn. But uh, uh, I think the company was part of, of that, and the other part of it probably is that... Uh, I, I wasn't underfoot all the time. Right. He wasn't you know. underfoot all the time, it's true. I had a lot of other playwrights that I was also working with, Jules Pfeiffer and, uh, mm -hmm. and Roy London and others, but, uh, and Bill Hoffman. But um, I think one of the other aspects also has to do with uh, the nature of the way Lanford goes about writing a play uh, to a certain extent, because a couple of elements that, that I think set him apart from most writers is that his style differs tremendously from one play to the next. <coughs> it really seems to have to do with what he's writing about. So that uh, in one uh, case, he may write what we've come to think of as lyrical realism and be very, very uh, Tennessee Williams-y, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in another, he can be very, very spare and very Henrik Ibsen-y. Uh, so you never know really you know, what, what uh, exact style Lampard is going to come up with. And, uh, that variety. From Baum and Gilead, which is a, a uh, huge play and stylistically bizarre in all kinds of ways with the people talking to the audience and simultaneous dialogue. It was, by the way, the first time I believe Lanford invented simultaneous dialogue for the stage. I don't think anyone had ever done it before. We had, you know, two or three different scenes going on at the same time. And Lan I kept saying, are you sure this will work? And Lanford said, well, I think audiences are smarter than we give them credit for. I think they can hear more than one story at the same time sort of like a three-ring circus. Yeah, and, I came uh, to town saying three-ring circus. Right? And uh, so we, 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 uh, we did that with Baum and Gilead. But on the other hand, at the other far extreme uh, away from that is a play like Tally's Folly, which is two characters, carefully orchestrated, very, very subtle movement, you know, uh, 
and, and uh, the, the, the life of the Plotted play is a... Plotted within an inch of its life. Plotted yeah. within an inch of its life and couldn't be more different from Bob and Gilead. So, uh, and Fifth of July, which is a rollicking Chekhovian comedy, as it were, and uh, um, the other play in the Tally trilogy, uh, Tally and Son, which is kind of a Lillian Hellman-esque, almost... Uh, it's supposed to be, yeah. Uh, mm. Melodrama. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it, it depends on the subject of the play that he was writing, and he always came up with something new, uh, a new approach to something, and. Uh, and I think that kept me stimulated uh, very much uh, as a director. In uh, uh, about, uh, I guess, 1986, you did an interview, Lanford, in which you were, uh, uh, one of the questions in the interview was, well, how do you work together? And you had said, well, you know, we can be working with the cast, and I, suddenly I'll notice uh, uh, Marshall off in the corner uh, talking with someone, and I feel I know what he's talking about. Where I just feel like I know, yeah, he's taking care of that aspect of things. It's never always, that question. So there's this, no, I this always, short. Yeah, hand. exactly. I, yeah. There was a short hand, and also maybe I, I started to say uh, I always knew that we were doing the same play. He wasn't doing some interpretation of my play. We, we both had the same vision for the play, uh, and it might be because while I was writing the play, I would bring scenes and pages to Marshall, and so. He had read, if, it, if the play took six months or a year to write, he had been in on the not ever saying a critical word, not saying anything except that's great, because he did that once, I didn't write the play. <laughs> uh, he, he said, hasn't that been done? And I didn't write it. Uh, uh, so he said, well, I won't do wouldn't that Wouldn't have again. been any good anyway. Yeah, wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> it had been done. It had been done. Uh, anyway. Uh, so he was very familiar, and many of the actors, if I was writing for specific actors, had been familiar with their parts for a year, with their character for a year. And uh, so it was just, that, that kind of process was very, by that time, by the time we're actually rehearsing, we both know exactly what we want. And Marshall isn't very good at writing dialogue, and I can't stage, so, you know, and I can't, I don't really talk to actors very well unless it happens to be an actor that needs to be talked to the way a playwright talks, and, uh, and then Marshall will say, you talk to this one. I think there, there was something also uh, about, um, you know, when we first started working together in terms of the collaboration process, I had heard rumors that Lanford was very uh, intrusive in the rehearsal process. And so the very first thing I told him uh, when he said, would you be interested in directing Bob and Gilead? I jumped right down his throat and said, oh, yeah. yes, but you won't talk to my actors. I will be the director. Only I will have this, you know. And I really, you know, laid down a, yeah. a, a very strict series of, of rules because I was very concerned that, uh, that he would somehow talk to the actors and, and tell them something different than I was telling them. And uh, over the years, as it has evolved, it's to the point now that I, you know, an actor asks me a question, I'll say, I don't know, go ask Lance, you know, and, and he will end up talking to the actors just as freely. Uh, there, there's no ego problem now. There's no, I don't, uh, I'm not jealous of, of any of that. If I do come up with a line, Lanford will usually say, okay, say that until I come up with something better. And sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes, it, you know. I'm still annoyed that, that the biggest laugh in Fifth of July is Marshall's line. <laughs> Wonderful. I don't deny it. <laughs> don't deny it. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, same uh, interview, Lanford, when you were talking about uh, collaborative uh, process and so on, uh, you ended the interview saying that you, you, you thought that a golden age was, uh, had evolved in American playwriting. And you mentioned uh, some names, some that you've mentioned even this today. This what year? 1986. Okay. And uh, you had mentioned uh, David Rabe, Irene Fornes, Sam Shepard, of course, David Mamet. John Guare. John Guare, and 10 others, which you yeah. said uh, I could name 10 others. Yeah. Uh, do you still feel that we're in that age 10 years later? If you, if you don't, what happened? What do you think uh, went on in the American theater? I think we're still writing some very good plays. Uh, so Terrence McNally is better now than he's ever been. He's just getting really good. I mean, really good. Uh, David Rabe is a very slow writer. Sam has slowed down enormously. You know, so have I. Uh, but, uh, and Irene Fornes is still working uh, the same way she always has and, and always will. But 
some very good writers, Nikki Silver and, and you go on and on, some very individual new voices have, have come up that I'm very excited about. Craig Lucas, uh, there are just some very exciting, uh, Margolis, uh, very exciting people writing now. The theater is very alive and well, but most of it's, it's decentralized tremendously. Much decentralized. You know. And there are a lot of things off-Broadway now that are, that are very, very exciting. Marshall, you, uh, even though you're going to go back to New York next year and, uh, and do plays, and I know that you're still, uh, still are very active in theater, you maybe do three, four productions a year, uh, you've, uh, as you just mentioned, you're now a tenured professor at Arizona State University. Uh, I think people would be curious, what, what led you through this odyssey? There you were in New York directing Broadway shows, uh, so uh, uh, the appearance of having the world at your feet, and, and now here you are 2,300 miles away from New I York. I say 23 years old again. Yeah, yeah that's uh, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it, it's been an arduous journey um, and a curious one. I, 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 the short answer is Hollywood uh, intervened. Uh, I had uh, reached a point at Circle Repertory where I really felt, well, you know, yes, we've accomplished all these wonderful things, but uh, I'm going to uh, you know, either oversee a museum theater for the rest of my life, or else I'm going to uh, really see if there are other things that I want to do. And w one of the things that I had wanted to do since I was a child was to direct film. And so I realized suddenly, you know, if I, if I had gone about my theater career the way I had so far gone about my, my film career, I would never have got anywhere, I, because the theater was my total passion for, for so many years. And to, you know, many years before we had uh, any success at all. Oh, yeah. Uh, I arrived in New York in 1961. My first professional success was in 1973. Hate to depress you, but yeah. that's 12 years. Yeah. I arrived uh, in 63 and 73, same play. Yeah. Was, was 10 uh, years later. 10 years later. So, you know, it does it take. I mean, Hotel Baltimore. Hotel Baltimore. It takes a long, long time to, to, to really get anywhere, and you really got to put your full energy into it. So I decided that I couldn't do both, and I, I really needed to make a choice, and that I had done what I could do at Circle Rep, and so I left to go to, to Los Angeles to pursue a film career. Uh, I spent seven or nearly eight years there uh, to absolutely no effect. <laughs> I was sitting there waiting for the phone to ring the way everybody else in LA is, and um, getting deeper and deeper in debt. And uh, still going occasionally back to New York to do an occasional play, but I was trying not to do any theater, uh, you know, like one play a year I would do. And uh, it, this last ended really with um, my, I had a very big year uh, about two years ago. I did four plays in New York all, all, all at the same time, uh, starting with uh, The Seagull at the National Actors Theater and Larry Kramer's The Destiny of Me off-Broadway. And then I did a uh, a one-man play with Stacy Keach called uh, Solitary Confinement. And that very busy season ended with the production of Redwood Curtain on Broadway of Lanford's. And we had been, what, almost three years in the development of, of that play. It took three years of, you know, from the first reading until we got that play on. And uh, we opened. We got really wonderful reviews. Frank Rich, you know, called it the play of the decade or some such. We took huge ads in the paper. Uh, we had a genuine movie star at the head of the cast. Uh, it was only three people in the, in the, in the show, so it wasn't like a, a burdened by a large cast or anything. Mm -hmm. It had everything going for it, in short, uh, that, that a Broadway show sh could possibly have going for it, including reviews. And nobody came. Nobody came. We would take out huge uh, ads uh, announcing the, you know, what the reviews were, and the box office would go up two or three thousand dollars. And so it ran for its six weeks that we had been guaranteed it would run, yeah. and then it closed. And I began to say at this point, something is deeply wrong with uh, the American theater. We're in serious trouble when a play, you know, when you can blame it on bad reviews, that's one thing, but when, when a play opens and gets good reviews, and you've got a movie star, and it's a play by Lanford Wilson, Pulitzer Prize winner, you know, and so forth, and it can't run, what's wrong? And the audiences who came liked it. They, were, they stood, stood and cheered uh, every night. We had standing ovations. So it was puzzling. And I began to reflect on it, and my reflection led me to uh, the suspicion that we have passed by a generation of theater goers. I'm going to get political here, because I think uh, 
from the years of, of uh, Kennedy's presidency and through the Johnson years uh, and then into the, the Nixon years. All those years, the theater and, and art in, in, in uh, America was considered something wonderful and, and fine and the spirit of the country was important and uh, so forth. And then beginning in the early 80s, uh, the country went, underwent a, a big sea change um, of, of spirit and of, uh, of goals. Uh, it became all about, uh, somehow about making money and about arbitrage and uh, junk bonds and I don't know, the whole phenomenon that overtook this country in the 80s. And uh, I think young people specifically began saying, uh, you know, why, the, why go to the theater? The theater is, uh, you know, yesterday's news. Uh, it's about making money. It's about, you know, uh, Hollywood was on the rise. You know, it's got to make several hundred million dollars at the box office. And, you know, this sort of thinking was, was, was what was prevalent. And um, people really got out of, out of the habit of going to the theater. There is no theater audience. There once was a theater audience. Our culture once developed the audience, and it no longer was doing that. There, there's a, a period now of, I think, you know, 12 to 20 years that, that that has not been true. And so I became very concerned about the values of our society and the way in which that was reflected in uh, the business of the theater. And I thought maybe that the thing for me to do was to go back to the grassroots and start with the kids and see what their interests were and see if they could inform me in some kind of way about where our civilization was and see if it could help me grow as an artist and, and help me to find some way to, to solve some of these problems. So to go back and reinvent. That's right. To start at the root, to build anew, to find a beginning point and to build from there. So for a playwright starting out, what do you think? I always say, I always say, start your own theater, you know, and, and start it in the town where you live. Uh, the the glamorous Broadway writer jumping up and down in the middle of the night, opening the the Times, that long shot with the girl jumping up and down right, and the guy Sardis. jumping up. That's, that's long, Sardis. long over. At Sardis, right? Yeah. Long, long over. Uh, it's not like that. It's be interested in the theater have friends who are in the theater, have friends who act, and put on the darn play, you know. Uh, you can, there, there are also all of the regional theaters that you can, where you can do a, you know, where you can do a show, but. I think, you know, Tony Kushner has written the, the best, you know, contemporary play of anybody in a long, long time, probably since Edward Albee, way back when. And, uh, and his, his method, uh, you know, it was a long, circuitous right, way to, to Broadway, and of course the play ended up losing money. Uh, so e even, even Angels in America. Yeah, it will, eventually. Yeah, it looks it will like it'll eventually. make it up in the tour. But he, you know, he didn't say, oh, I want to be a Broadway playwright and start writing uh, plays in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his route was from Seattle in a very small theater in Seattle, you know, then through the huge developmental support of the Mark mm -hmm. Taper Forum in L.A. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, a translation along the way, and, and you know. enormously uh, helpful producers who were who were visionary enough, if you will, to say we're going to put on both these huge plays and do the one and give them another year to to work on the second play, which was All not very good when it was in life. Very expensive. That's why it didn't make money. It was very expensive to have to cancel three and four performances that they had scheduled of one of the play of the second play. And so a week would end up with, with five performances instead of eight uh, while they were turning over. But when he got it, when he got the play, the second play on the way he wanted it, he had solved that problem of that second play. I didn't think it was possible. I read the first play when I was in Philadelphia and ran downstairs with it to Marshall. It was just the best play I'd read in I don't know when. And, uh, since David Ray, since uh, Hurley Yeah, Burley. since Hurley <laughs> I know. Uh, and, and uh, then someone pirated me a copy of Perestroika from the L.A. production. And uh, I read it, and it was a mess. And I said, oh, no, oh, oh this is terrible. This is, this, it's not going to work. And I, I couldn't imagine how he could make it work. Ended up being, if anything, better than the, than the first one. If anything play. better, yeah. yeah if they're, anything they're better one. than the second one. When I went to see Perestroika on opening night, I had the same feeling I'd had reading the first, the first act, like, oh my God, this is, this is just the best thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. So this is still uh, possible then. And you it go was done here, on Broadway. Well, so so it, 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 it. Uh, it, 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 
belie, it, you know, it makes a lie of everything I've said, except we're talking about a masterpiece, and we should be talking about just nice, good, interesting theater. Yeah. Uh, and, and as Marshall said, even that didn't make money, but it will, it, it will. I think another uh, aspect of it too, John, is uh, of course, you know, I'm, I'm in a university setting now, and so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about the kind of processes that we are working on at the grassroots level. And I think uh, American College Theater Festival has for some time now been really interested in the development of new American plays, and you've been encouraging new writers to write. Uh, I understand that, that uh, that uh, it's the, the, the word out there among the uh, colleges is, you know, unless you have a new play, uh, you know, you haven't got much of a chance of getting in the finals at the Kennedy Center. That's, that's what they think. Interesting to hear. That's yeah. what mm. they think. We're and sitting, we're sitting on the set the of The Seagull. Oh, I, know, yes. I see that. I'm, okay. that that's a, a, a wonderful new play. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think because the ACTF uh, and, and others, uh, uh, organizations like it, have encouraged writing on the college level, this has been terrific. Uh, and, and I think it, has, it says a lot about the future of the American theater. Uh, Jim Leonard, of course, who was one of our central playwrights at Circle Rep, uh, I, I discovered from his uh, uh, ACTF winning production of uh, several years ago of The Diviners. Yeah. And I brought him to New York as a result of that play playing here. And uh, then we subsequently you know, toured Southeast Asia with it and so forth. And Jim wound up teaching playwriting for the last seven years at Arizona State University, mm -hmm. which is how I came to be there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a collab, I have two of my classes at the moment um, uh, in the fall, I teach a, a directing class that's called the collaboration between the actor and the director, and the purpose of which really is to discover how movement should evolve uh, organically from the, the, the needs of the actors uh, l bringing to life the circumstances of the play. And in the spring, uh, currently, I'm, I teach a class that I call the collaboration between the actor and the playwright. And mm -hmm. It's a directing course. I have six writers, six directors, and a company of 16 actors, eight MFA students and, uh, and eight undergraduates. And the writers, uh, the directors propose uh, a theme. They say, I, I, I really want to, uh, uh, something that's deeply, passionately important to me is this. I, I, I want to explore uh, being a parent to your parents, let's say, as a theme. And the writers choose, well, uh, out, out of this, this, this is the thing that interests me, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so they, they get paired up, and then they write their play specifically for the 16 actors in the uh, class. And uh, it really is an exploration of the collaborative process to, to understand that an idea, you, you can't really just sit around and wait for a playwright to you know, have a good idea at some point. Good ideas can come from any, any number of, uh, of places or shared uh, concern, shared themes. Mm -hmm. It can originate, usually it originates with the playwright, and then it's up to the director and to the cast to become so involved with the playwright's concerns and, and part of his or her world that they work in a collaborative fashion with the playwright's original idea. But it can also be generated uh, in other ways, uh, from a director's idea, even sometimes, uh, I, I think a lot, a lot of Lanford's inspiration sometimes has come from seeing a particular actor and, and, and saying, I, I just want to write something from them, and, and the play comes about uh, uh, on some s s unconscious level. Uh, uh, you, you discover why that actor tips off some kind of uh, mm -hmm. response or, or concern that you didn't even know you quite had. It happens from time to time. It, it, your class is at. Uh it's not collaborative writing. The, the writer is writing the, writer the play. Writes. The, the writer writes, yeah. The writer writes, the director I've always, directs. I've always <laughs> said that, the, that I think the actor has to go through the same process that the playwright has. You know, you, somewhere in your experience, you've had every experience. And you have to find that in order to relate it truthfully. And if someone else is having it that you're writing about, and that's what a, an actor has to find that experience somewhere. That, event in their lives. Yeah, and, and, the actors do some, sometimes do some improvisations at the playwright's right, request, yeah. saying, you know, um, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure, what would you do in this case, and, you know, and, and, and sort of improvise some things, and the, so, but it's, it's really uh, as background to give the playwright, yeah, you know, uh, a, a fertile imagination to, to operate from. How did you develop 
as someone who looks at a stage and does something unique to it. And what does style mean to you? I guess that's yeah. the essence of the question. Uh, I have been told by people that, that they can spot my work, uh, and uh, I like to think it's because of the quality of it, you know. Uh, oh, boy, this is so good. It must be Marshall Mason, yeah. Uh, but but uh, because I, I do think the, the style, um, coming from the, the Greek word stylus, uh, which is the finished uh, finishing tool that the sculptor used to, uh, to get the final effect, style emerges from the material. It's, it's like <laughs> uh, form follows function, you know. Um, in, in the same kind of way, you, what one must begin with is what is the world of the play. And if I have a style as a director, it is in tr truly trying to explore that thoroughly in terms that the actors are going to be able to fully embody, meaning that it has to be, be broken down. The world of the play is not just the idea of the play, but specifically environment. Where and when does it take place so that the actors can engage their imaginations in terms of their sensory uh, uh, gifts. Uh, to, uh, you know, uh, we, we were laughing a minute ago, making fun of, of uh, you know, the, the heat. But things like the heat and the, and the time of day and the time of year and uh, all those things that were very important to, to Chekhov and to Stanislavski are very important to me. And so I, I really very thoroughly examine all that uh, and, and try to, to uh, have the actors uh, take on the goal of living the role within the world that the playwright has created, uh, has imagined. So that our, our job becomes uh, all together to give that dimension and texture and form. And in doing that, um, it involves a lot of detail. You know, Gilgit often uh, likes to talk about the process of paring away. In other mm -hmm. words, he talks yes. about his process of performing as getting every possible bit of piece uh, that's going to make this character happen. And then the question of letting go, letting go. And, and only keeping those details which tell absolutely precisely what it's about and communicates what it's about. And I guess what I've been fishing around for, uh, Marshall, since I've seen so much of your work, is that your work has the quality of also having been pared away. It's the action. You know, it isn't just no, the it's detail. The, it's, it's also real. It's the truly, it's, but, but it's tied to the action of the play. Uh, and, and uh, you know, working within the world of the play, not having uh, uh, disparate actors, having disparate ideas about what all this is, but trying yeah. to have everyone work together within the specific world of the play in three dimensions, and discovering the action and, and, and everything that's not relevant to this specific want, this specific need, this specific move that has to come out of that want, everything else uh, uh, needs to go away. I, I do like to have my, my moves uh, be totally organic, but to be so simple and so direct and so unquestionably right that, uh, that they don't, that it, they should look as if they're improvised, but they should be as, as uh, fine as a, as a ballet. Well, uh, uh, absolutely, and uh, sort of uh, one of the, the points of our uh, sitting here talking today, you know, we are on the set of Chekhov's The Seagull, uh, certainly a, a seminal work and certainly a, a work and particularly a relationship between the playwright Chekhov and the director Stanislavski, which uh, most people would agree, I think the two of you would uh, set a tone created a, an atmosphere and a world that continues to affect American theater. I w was wondering how the two of you relate yourself to the, what many be think of as the beginnings of modern theater, avant-garde. The lyric realism. That lyric so realism. Horribly the famous for, yes. The poetic realism, which right. uh, is associated with uh, uh, Lanford. People started calling me Chekhovian, and I said, God, I'd better read him and see what they're talking about. So I read uh, complete works of Chekhov and uh, uh, not the stories, the, the, the plays of Chekhov and uh, was blown utterly out of the water. I couldn't believe it. It was just the most thrilling thing I'd ever. And I seemed to, uh, I thought, you know, he said modestly, I understood them completely. I just <laughs> thought they were the most wonderful things in the world. Uh, Three Sisters was my favorite play, the best play I'd ever, I'd ever Still read. Still my favorite play. Yeah, I think my, mine too. And, uh, but, so I didn't know that. But, bef and in a translation, you don't really get 
lyric realism. You get the Chekhovian scenes and, 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 and the Chekhovian characters. Uh, what I had been, I think I read somewhere that uh, a, a certain writer <clears throat> wrote, took the way people spoke naturally in conversation and turned it into poetry. And when I saw that writer's work, I said, no, he doesn't, not at all. But what a great thing to do. <laughs> and, and I think that's what I started out trying to do. Um, and I, I, was, I was, of course, influenced by, by Tennessee. You know, I was drawn to another thing that I've never really quite got, which is the magic uh, of, of, uh, of uh, some of the things that Miller did, like Death of a Salesman, because the director that I saw mm. when I was 18 is in the audience tonight. Mm. To, you know. Leslie Gosh. Irene Cooker just directed the most beautiful production. I think it's probably why I went into the theater. When people talk about getting into theater, they either describe it as getting the bug, the disease, falling in love with it, running off to the circus. Uh, it's very seldom uh, described in, in conscious, rational terms, uh, what brings someone to the theater. What actually turned you out for the theater? When I was eight years old, uh, I went to the movies every Saturday at a, an allowance. And 25 cents would buy me nine, nine cents for admission to the film. And I had a dime for popcorn and a nickel for a Coke. And a penny left over for some candy, you know. Those were the days. Actually, Phoenix is almost that good. You can see a movie for 275 there, which is great. It's one of the reasons I liked living there. Um, and on one Saturday afternoon, I saw a movie called Pinky. And it was just the most extraordinary thing I'd ever experienced. And I sat through the credits at the beginning of the film again to see why was this film so meaningful to me? I mean, who, who, who had done this? And the last credit was directed by Elia Kazan. And I didn't know what a director was. I was only eight years old. But I immediately started going around telling everybody who would listen to me, my favorite director is Elia Kazan. <laughs> and uh, so he became my, my sort of uh, hero. And uh, of course, through, through uh, that, uh, I was led to uh, the works of Tennessee Williams, uh, specifically Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and, and uh, uh, of course, uh, a Streetcar Named Desire, both of which was uh, Kazan and Williams working at the height of their collaboration together. And, um, and, and so I came across that. The, the other person of great influence on me was, was uh, Alvina Krauss that I mentioned already. She taught me acting at Northwestern. And it was through her understanding and, and belief in uh, honesty on the stage that, that I, she taught me everything in a sense I, I've ever learned just about. And uh, uh, so, so Tennessee Williams uh, uh, sandwiched in between there. Those are the three big influences on my life. I think I'd fallen in love with, with the theater, with uh, the two, produ uh, two productions, with the uh, uh, death of a salesman at uh, Southwest Missouri State, and uh, in, in Springfield, the touring company of Brigadoon. Mm -hmm. In both of them, time changes. You go back, back into a That's different it. place and back, you know, and it was the, that magic just <laughs> boggled my mind. It was the most thrilling thing I'd ever seen. And, uh, and as I, as I said, I, I would go to a movie. I didn't like the, the difficult ones, the, 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 the dramas I didn't like. Uh, the musicals I liked, I would dance down the street, street singing all the numbers uh, afterwards. But then I saw East of Eden, and it made me want to go into the theater. Uh. It blew me so completely away uh, that I, 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 had to be, I had to be a part of that. And, and it connected to the theater instead of to movies. Yeah, the two names that I have left out that Lampert has mentioned by, in a way there, <coughs> James Dean yeah. and Marlon Brando. Those, yeah. those are the, I mean, those Incredibly, profoundly, profoundly important. Uh, uh, they were the icons of our, of, of, of our uh, formative years, I think. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. OK, we have, a, we have a question over here. Mr. Wilson, uh, did you write the screenplay for Redwood Curtain? And um, what is your opinion of playwriting contests? First question, no. I didn't do the screenplay for uh, Redwood Curtain. It's about to come out in World Tonight, Tonight, to I think. Tonight. That's right, tonight. Yeah, or tomorrow night. Oh, no, I mean, no, I had nothing to do with it at all. And you, you don't care? I mean, if they really I didn't say that. I just said that. <laughs> I just said that they didn't ask, they didn't ask me, and I had no, nothing to do with it. I was, there, uh, I was there when they were filming it. It's changed quite a bit. 
uh, it, it's changed a lot. It would have been interesting to have the assignment to open it out the way they, the way they did. It would have been interesting. Uh, it's on Hallmark Hall of Fame, so it's on television. Oh, that's yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the second question, the playwriting contests are, are as old as playwriting. Uh, the Greeks had playwriting contests. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we have, I guess this is the only, do we have playwriting contests yeah. anymore? Yeah, well, we have all sure. kinds of playwriting uh, contests. Do we? Oh, good. Uh, th actually, this you is one, one of the one. biggest oh, yes, playwriting I, I guess contests. I, yeah. You won one the recently. The 10-minute play contest. You won the 10-minute play, ten ten play contest. contest. Uh, so therefore, yeah. I love them. You know, I think they're very valuable. <laughs> anything that makes someone write, anything that gives impetus to someone to write something is, is excellent. And if the standards are kept quite high for the awards, then the impetus is, is to write something better and better. Anything that encourages anyone to sit on their butt and actually write something is important, because it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Someone uh, else? Thank so, you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I'm curious on both of your reactions when something you've worked on has left your collaborative uh, minds and hands. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of uh, Hot Al Baltimore when that became a, a TV show. And also, I remember a few years ago, there was a revival of Baum and Gilead. And I'm wondering about revivals of other work that you've done. Uh, that, that revival, were you, in, uh, were you too Marshall involved in that? In, uh, I, I watched, but Marshall was very involved. He went to Chicago and saw it and said, we've got to do this, and, and we've got to bring this back to New York. Well, it was, it was a brilliant production. I saw it at Manetta Lane Theater. Was that your work then, or was that some? No, that, uh, John Malkovich. Malkovich, right. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what had happened in that regard was uh, I had directed the original Bauman Gilead in 1965, and it was one of the most special things I've ever done. I, I, I felt very, very strongly about it, and it was a, a, I haven't done anything better since, let's put it mm -hmm. that way. And for the next 20 years, people kept saying, oh, you should bring back Bauman Gilead. And I was, I guess, rather superstitious. I thought, well, I'll never be able to do it that well again. And uh, so, uh, I, I was very happy to be going to Chicago, and I went to Steppenwolf and saw uh, John Malkovich's production at Steppenwolf in Chicago, and I said, oh, thank God, I don't have to do it again. <laughs> I can bring John's production into New York. And so we, we did a co-production, Circle Rep and Steppenwolf Company, and, and we, uh, it was made up of both companies, and, uh, and it was quite a, quite a wonderful, wonderful production, I thought. Yeah, it was glorious. Uh, I saw a production in Seattle of, of uh, 5th of July, uh, not long after we had done it, and uh, there, there's a moment uh, in, in, the, in the play when Sally, uh, talking about, uh, she's just said, uh, oh, I don't believe in death. And they say, I, I beg your pardon? She says, no, it's either, you know, uh, what, what did she say exactly? Uh, uh, you're here and then you're, you're gone. You're here and you're, then you're gone. You can't or something worry about like that. the going, you have to worry about the being here. About the being here, right, about the going on. Yeah, and and, and then she suddenly says, is, 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 that, a, is, that, is a that a bird? bird? Is, that a bat? is that a bat? No, it's gone. No, gone. And so it, it, it's done very, you know, she, she, she suddenly sees yeah. something. Is that a bird? Is that a bat? No, gone. Mm -hmm. And everybody else, of course, is looking, and that's the whole humor And she's on to something else by that time. She's yeah. thinking of something else. And the production in Seattle, uh, the actress playing it said, uh, no, I don't worry about life, about death, because you can't worry about the end. You have to worry about the going on. Is that a bird? <laughs> is that a bat? <laughs> no. Mm. Gone. <laughs> you know, and by this time I'm re reaching for the razor blades. You yeah. Know? Right. Give me something. Get out. Get me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so it can be disconcerting. But uh, how I saw I, I saw a production of, of Burn This. This is a playwright's hell. I, I came I came to this city. I am toured all over half of the city, and then taken to a preview of, of my show it was the worst production of any play I'd ever seen. I mean, not just a play of mine, of any play. And, and we were up, all, then there was a, a reception, a party for me with all of the actors in the theater. And they were just so appreciative and, and it became clear that they were incapable of doing it any different from the way they were doing it the director and all of the actors were thrilled with their production. And, and any suggestion that I made 
was dismissed as, as, as so irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't get to sleep all that night. I was, I was squired around all of the next day and ended up having to change clothes very quickly to go to the richest house in, in this city and, and be feted by all of their sponsors and all of their corporate people <laughs> and all of that who were dressed formally. I did not get more than 10 feet into this room for the first hour. And I finally had to, with people coming up and shaking my hand and everyone saying, I can't wait to see the show tonight. And also the director saying, we looked at your notes, we've redone it completely, it's just <laughs> glorious tonight, you know. I went right from, from that, I had about 10 minutes to sit down in, in a room by myself, and we had a cup of tea, I think, and rush off to the theater to see it done exactly the same as it was done before, only maybe a little worse. worse. <laughs> Opening night jitters, you know, yes. right? <laughs> and I was so, I was so exhausted, I, emotionally drained and physically drained, so it can just be awful in answer to your question. One question that I, I want to comment on also in, in terms of this question, just one little thing, and that is uh, with Hot Out Baltimore that you mentioned specifically being done as a television show, which neither Lanford nor I had anything to do with, and now with Redwood Curtain being done for Hallmark Hall of Fame, which neither Lanford nor I have had anything to do with, um, it, it is a great shame in a, in a sense that, that the kind of work that we have done on stage has not been able so far to uh, go into film to, to, to have the large audience that I suspect it might have. It would be nice to but, see us. Uh, have we we, we have developed together, we, we did a, a screenplay for Burn This, but it, it is as of this moment still unmade. And so. a screenplay for Tally's Folly. Which so we have those two available if any of you has you yeah. know, five or six million dollars. Sort of, incorpor sort of incorporates uh, Tally's Folly and Tally and Son. I, I, I love them. They're, they're fine. But Another question? Someone? Yes, please. Before, uh, Mr. Mason, you were talking about uh, getting back with the students and redefining the upcoming generation of theater audience. I wondered uh, what type of things the, that audience is in fact interested in and how much the impact of them being raised with television and with movies and with a whole different pace and internal clock almost of what they're listening to impacts on what's being written and should potential writers for theater be paying attention to that or writing their own things? Well, I think it's inevitable uh, because writers write from reality and, and uh, re reality is uh, something that uh, I don't think that reality so much is changing, but our perception of it is. And uh, as a result, uh, you, you get uh, the, you know, we're no longer writing the well-made play in quite the same way that they were, you know, 70 years ago, or even 50 years ago. Uh, Tony Kushner, I'm sure, is going to have an enormous effect on the future, future writers, because I think he tapped in, 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 in a way, to the, the, the uh, significant scene that, that and, and the, the movement of the play, the way that, it's almost Shakespearean in a kind of way, the it's way that play moves, yeah. you know. And so we, we are, I think as a result of MTV and, and uh, film cuts and what have you, we are aware of uh, contrasting realities in, in, in a new uh, uh, imagistic uh, way that uh, should bode very well, I think, for the, the possibilities uh, of writers on stage. I think that the old rules, in, in a sense, have been greatly loosened, and, and, the, and a, there's no longer really any point to, uh, to a playwright being Ibsenized, that you must write like you know, a, 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 a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, I, I think we, you know, the training still has to be, one should appreciate Ibsen, because Ibsen is a very, very great playwright, a genius, uh, and, uh, and of course Chekhov. Um, and Shakespeare. We need to, to, to study all these people and see how they related to their particular time. But uh, there are no formulas that work uh, in, in writing. And people have to take into account the reality they see around them. And uh, we get so, that, so much of that these days in, in bits and pieces and, and uh, you know, CNN uh, news briefs. There's very little depth to what we are, uh, as a nation, constantly bombarded with. And it takes, I think it seems to be taking our, our national psyche a number of years to sort of react to what the real meaning of an event uh, was. Uh, and uh, the, the, I, I'm struck by 
the recent bombing in uh, Oklahoma City, uh, the, uh, what kind of effect in the long run this is going to have on our national psyche will be very interesting to see uh, whether, whether people feel, oh, maybe we are leaning a little bit too far to the right uh, now. I, I wonder if it'll have that political implication in the long run. Um, and I think uh, people, writers, uh, uh, writing are, are freed from stylistic inhibitions. Uh, we, we are on the verge now, of course, of all kinds of new technology. Um, the play that I'm working on, Riga, uh, by, by William Hoffman, uh, as I said, he, he and I collaborated on As Is together in 1985, which is one of the most important plays that I think I've ever done, because we introduced the whole uh, subject of AIDS to the American public in a, in a major kind of way. Uh, and Bill has, has gone into multimedia in a big way. There, there's there's a, a lot of video in the show. There are a lot of slides. Uh, it's a play that examines the commonality in a sense of uh, homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, and, and, and racism, uh, and the, 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 the way in which uh, uh, hate is at the center of all those uh, three phenomena. Um, in order to truly explore that, he's had to you know, use things from vaudeville and things from, mm. from film and things from slides. And mu there's music, there's dance, there's a little of everything. It's just there's definite it's, performance it's art. It's a lot, too, a lot of know. stuff, yeah. You know, he went over to, he went, went to Riga to research the play, and Brought there he is. Oh, I mean, there the actor is on stage showing you slides that he took while he went to Riga to research the play and the people who now live in the house where his, where his grandmother lived and what they had to say about that. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. very complex yeah. and, and multi-layered, as I think Angels in America is. I think uh, that, that sort of says something about the kind of future we could expect. Mm -hmm. I think it's a liberating influence and, and, uh, and ought to be encouraged. Uh, what I find with my kids at Arizona State University is that, uh, uh, again, they are writing from things that are important to them. And uh, my, I, I believe the biggest concern that I have is that college students today don't seem to be as aware of what's going on in the world as I would like them to be. Uh, so many people feel, oh, it's so ugly, I simply can't deal with it. And so they don't watch even CNN or Peter Jennings or whatever. They don't read the New York Times or the Washington Post. They don't really know. They, they sort of hear it secondhand, but that's close enough because it's so horrible uh, sometimes the reality that we must experience. And of course, the artist cannot be shielded from from those horrors, we need to go to look them directly in the face and to use them as inspiration for our work. And uh, so I, I find I have to constantly challenge my students to stay abreast of what's going on and not, not try to hide from it and, and write some. I have a wonderful student, David Vague, who's a terrific writer, but he keeps drifting back and trying to write what Tennessee Williams might once have written. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, no, David, that's not it. This mm -hmm. is today. What, what's going on today, you know? Someone else? Yes. How would you compare the, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility of that kind of collaboration taking place in American theater contrasted to theaters in other countries, you know, say in England? Uh, it seems like the economics and the reality of American theater, you know, everything is working against that kind of collaboration continuing. And I, I mean, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a damning aspect of uh, American theater. We are at a point of, of uh, great, uh, a great crossroads, in a sense, historically, in the sense that uh, um, there, uh, recently at Circle Rep, uh, we've had a big change in the management and in the direction of the theater. Uh, there's been new management there. And as a result, uh, uh, Lanford and, uh, and Tanya Barrison, who is the, uh, and I, who are the three founders, have, uh, have left that theater uh, and are homeless at the moment. Um, and uh, we're looking for how to go about <coughs> finding a place that, that we can continue our collaboration because it seems as if the, uh, the Circle Rep uh, is not going to be devoted to the kind of vision that we uh, instigated when we set the, that, that place up. It's going in a new direction. They're leaning so more toward developing plays developing than plays, they are right. really company. Uh, developing plays as opposed company. to developing playwrights. Yeah. I think that's the real distinction that I would make. Right, they, and, they, and they don't seem to be interested in, the comp in a company of actors. And so no. these, uh, I always wrote for a company of actors. That's not for me. Yes. 
Um, Mr. Wilson, why did you want to burn burn this? When I was uh, when I was writing burn this, I uh, it was specific. It was right after uh, right after Baum and Gilead had had a revival, and I said, why aren't why can't I write plays like that? Like Lanford Wilson. Like Lanford <laughs> Wilson, and get some excitement into the play. So I, it was a burn this was a deliberate effort to get back to a sort of physical. Uh, energy and an excitement that I, uh, that I felt in that play. And, uh, and also a kind of, a kind of daring in, uh, in, in, in the writing. And so I started writing at the top of, of, of each page that I was, I was writing it uh, longhand. I started writing, burn this. In other words, tell secrets that you, that you don't want anyone to know. Uh, th that's what I was trying to, I was just trying to remind myself to to go for the gut, you know, in, 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 in this play. Be personal, I had, yeah. Be personal, be personal. Uh, I had no intention at all of calling it Burn This. Great title. And Marshall said, Marshall said one day, I said, I cannot imagine what this play is gonna be called. I was, I was within, <laughs> within 30 page, uh, 20 pages of finishing it. And uh, he said, I always assumed you're gonna call it Burn This. I said, oh my God, I couldn't possibly call it Burn This. Do you know what people would say? And he said, I thought that was the point. <laughs> exactly, it is. It exactly was. So after he had said that, I could not not call it burn this. So that's, that's why it was called that. Another question, yes. We know that in a collaboration this good, there have to have been some bad moments. If, it, if it's not too personal, could you tell us about some and how you solved them? The, the, the one that stands out in my mind is uh, over Tally's Folly, uh, because uh, the, 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 uh, Lanford had written the first draft of Tally's Folly, and it was a, indeed a, quite a wonderful play. And we had a reading of it in, a, at the Circle Rep uh, in our Friday readings. And uh, as Lanford said, I, I usually spend most of my time trying to encourage him and saying, yes, that's great, that's great, that's great, until he gets it finished. And then I can you know, say, oh, well, I think this is wrong and this is wrong. But he was so happy with uh, Tally's Folly, and it was such a special creation, that I think I jumped the gun a little bit on him. He was not ready to hear that I thought it was anything except perfect. And I immediately, sort of after the reading, jumped down his throat about it and said, well, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong about it, and I, th I don't believe I this. I bristled quite a lot. And yeah. he was real unhappy with me. But you know what? He said, we'll have a, we'll have a talk. And Mylon Stitt and, and Marshall met with me in, in, in Marshall's office, and Marshall talked, and I, I, I say this because I went in there with a real chip on my shoulder because uh, I thought it was pretty damn good. And either Marshall was more tactful than I've ever known him to be in, in his life or else he prepared himself very well because within a few minutes, I was actually listening to what he was saying and saying, ooh, that's a good idea. That's a good point. And, uh, and started, you know, within 10 minutes, I'm sure I started taking notes. Uh, uh, rewrote it very quickly. It became a plotted play. It wasn't in the first in the first draft. It became a real locked into place plotted play. Uh, but so here here is an example where uh, by really going over the edge and really uh, uh, getting in each other's face, uh, some something really oh, yeah. astonishingly it much good. Better. Yeah, came the same out of problem it. on Angel's Fall. He hated the the Catholicism in it because he just thought that I had said that Catholicism is the be-all and end-all with this priest. He was so on the priest's side, and I was so uh, on the uh, professor's uh, side, side yeah. that I kept after him to... And I didn't think I was on the priest's side at all. I thought it was a fair argument. You know? And uh, and so uh, uh, I kept going back and said, because I didn't want to make that statement either. I didn't see it, you know. But uh, so I, I rewrote that for several weeks trying to... Uh, Satisfy my yeah. insatiable yeah. <laughs> uh, demands. Because, well, well he was just—he was really crazy. I mean, he was over the top. I thought. What, what, do, you, what do you do? What do you do when you just feel like taking each other and shaking oh, well, no, each other? I, I, just, I, I have said, I have said, God damn it! It doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> you know, in other words, I am sick of writing this. I'm sick of rewriting. I'm sick of working on it. It's good enough. <laughs> you know. I want to uh, make I want to make uh, two two points on, on this uh, issue, though. I believe with the exception of those, you could pretty much say it's been very positive, mm. surprisingly positive. 
we don't fight much. We don't have disagreements. We don't say, you're an asshole, I'm right. You know, it, 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 has, it just hasn't happened like that. We've had a very easy time of it. But the second thing I want to say, and this is very important, is that we get the idea sometimes that collaboration is everybody sitting around and agreeing. And that isn't the nature of collaboration sometimes at all. Sometimes the best collaboration comes out of butting heads and, and, and disagreeing and fighting it out until you find what is the best solution for the artistic work. Until you see it, the other point of view. So uh, it isn't about everybody sitting around and agreeing, although our experience has been pretty much one of, of agreement throughout our, our, our lives. I have been in rehearsals just casually. Sometimes I think, you know, we're not getting exactly what we had hoped for in a, in, a, in a rehearsal, or we're not getting it yet, and we just don't have the patience or the understanding. It, it's just, it's, it's very frustrating. And sometimes it's the writer's fault, and you just don't see that always. You know, sometimes you just don't see it. In Angel's Fall, I still want to go back and rewrite that argument because now that I look at it from a distance, it's, it's really these two people arguing over, over the possession of this Indian uh, doctor. And uh, I wasn't really doing that. I mean, that wasn't really what I was writing. Uh, or if that's what I was writing, I didn't know that's what I was writing. And with that intention, I could write that debate or whatever it is a hell of a lot better or a lot cleaner. And, uh, you know, so... You, you, you don't know until for a long time what exactly you've got. David Rabe said it took him three years before he under, after uh, Hurley Burley was on before he began to understand the play. A last question. Mr. Wilson, you talked about uh, uh, seeing Brigadoon and then doing something radical now. Is it possible that you might follow Terrence McNally and Marsha Norman and write a musical? Oh, I would or, love or to write what a are you musical. Doing? If I could think of an idea that was worth working on for two years and write a musical. I would love to write a musical. I, I, I do not put musicals down at all. I usually hate them when I actually have to see them. But every once in a while, there's something wonderful like Evita, and I just am blown away by that. I, I love that. Uh, I love Evita. It was just a thoroughly wonderful evening. At one point, uh, someone approached Lanford to do a musical of uh, Tobacco Road, and uh, Lanford said, he thought about it for a little while, and then he said, I don't think these people have anything to sing about. <laughs> and turned it down. They didn't, yeah. I, I've turned down a lot of offers to do musicals because it just didn't make sense. Uh, uh, Rose Tattoo, no, no, no. He did do, of course, uh, uh, the opera libretto oh, yeah, I did the opera for libretto. Summer and Smoke, Summer which and is Smoke. A, a quite a Lee Hoybee's opera. And a number of plays of mine, one-act plays, have been turned into operas, but that's opera, and I don't really... I'm not that fond of opera anyway, and I didn't do anything. They just took the play and turned them into opera. I, I wasn't well, you a did collaboration. The, you did the, the librettos. Only on one. Well, the other the, three I didn't. It's a wonderful libretto. Mm. Was there another question in there? I, I was wondering if Mr. Wilson would talk about his writing process, what he does before he writes, while he writes, how often he writes, and when he knows he's finished. Uh, I, I'm a self-taught writer or something. I don't know how I do anything, and I, I do it wrong. and. And you shouldn't do it the way I do it. But I, ru I run around, I run around, annoying everyone I know, saying I have nothing to write about. I have no opinions of anything. I shouldn't have started writing this uh, writing at all because now people expect me to continue to do it, and I don't know how to do it because I, I don't know what I don't know what writing is. And I don't have a character. I don't have anything. And then, at some point, pray God, I said, Well, there is that that one character, and so I start writing maybe one character, or so somehow <clears throat> something comes some, from somewhere, and as soon as the characters start talking, then I begin to understand that there's another point of view and someone else comes in, and, and it, <clears throat> it just sort of happens. You don't really know where or how. I don't outline, I, I make, I, I, I have a, ton of marginalia as I start writing. I, I write things in the margin saying, I, I think the last line of this act is, or she has had two sons and killed them both, you know, but we don't know this yet. I mean, things that occur to me, I write in, in the margin, but uh, the process is I, I, when I am, when I am working, I'll write for about half hour after I get up in the morning, I write for about 
from two to three or four or five hours, but it's usually three, two, three, and uh, until I'm burned out and just can't think of another word, not another word occurs to me. And then the next day I get up, and about half an hour after I get up, I read through very quickly what I've, what I've read, making a few very brief changes, but, and, and then I, I sort of know how I want to go on from there. Uh, if I read through that and don't know how I want to go on from there and feel like I, I want to write, but I just don't know what in the hell happens next, but I do know a scene that I want to happen later in the play, I'll write it out of, out of sequence and have no problem with that. I don't know where it goes in the play, I just know that this is a scene that's in the play. It's an obligatory scene, therefore I can write it now. And then eventually, sometimes it's really the next thing that had to be said, and sometimes it's in the second act when I'm working on the first. Mound Builders came to us. Uh, there were a great many uh, places in the script, in the original, the first draft of the script that said, Bridge to Come. Bridge to Come. Because we he had written it in so many, so many different, uh, you know, scattered pieces that, that we didn't know how we got from one place to the other, but uh, yeah. eventually he wrote those bridges and the play came together. Yeah, it was, it was forever. Uh, uh, Serenading Louis, the first draft also, was all in bits and pieces and scenes, and I put it together one night over about 10 hours that just, I suddenly knew how I wanted it, you know, I knew what the form of the thing was, but, but uh, both Baum and Gilead and, uh, and uh, uh, Lemon Sky and a third one, uh, Rhymers of Eldritch, oh, right. were all written linearly. I started out at the beginning and wrote them straight through, and they look like ones that have been pieced together. They look like ones that are they're they're more collagey than than any of them. But uh, I wrote those straight through. I think probably because I was listening to the sound of the play. With Gingham Dog, though, and with um, other plays, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Was Huddle one of those? I think so. Where, where he, uh, he he would, or and certainly burned this. Uh, I remember my first experience of those plays was Lanford coming to me and saying, listen to this, and, and he had a page of a character just yakety 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 yeah. yakety yakking. And I, and I listened and go, oh, wow, hmm, what is it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then, as, as Lanford said, eventually, after he finishes, this character is talking, you don't know who the character is or what the circumstance is or anything, but it's just, you know, uh, dialogue or monologue, and then eventually he writes, uh, I remember Gloria in Gingham Dog, I, I think that was, a, uh, well, no, uh, the first one was Vincent, wasn't Vincent, it? Vincent, yeah. Uh, writing Vincent about how sick he was of uh, sort mm -hmm. of the, the, the way politics had taken over and ruined his life. That, that kind of polemic uh, in dialogue is sometimes the, seems to be the source. So you write from character, though. Yeah, from character, from character always, always. As opposed to plot. And mm -hmm. in fact, I know for, for uh, one thing that you should know about his writing is that, that if he knows what's going to happen, mm -hmm. it bores him to death and yeah. he loses interest in the project. It's so many times he, he start, started out on a play and said, oh God, now I know everything that happens and, and has abandoned the play yeah. and it doesn't get written. It's no fun. I, I don't know why that is, but it's, it's, it's really true. There are no discoveries left and, and I, could, I could write it out, but it's, what's the fun in that? How do you know when you're finished? What? How do you know when you're finished? Uh, when the play comes to an end, I think the end in the first draft has very rarely changed. It's, that's always the end of, of, of the play. Uh, one time when I thought I had a, a, an idea for the end, it turned out to be in 5th of July, it turned out to be the end of the first act. Uh, but when I come to the end, I always know intuitively this is the end of the play. Uh, which is not the same as being finished with Which the is not the same as being finished. <laughs> then I go through and rewrite the whole bloody thing. Uh, I have a reading of it just for me or for, for, for friends, and, and everything I thought was perfectly clear or really obvious, they haven't got it all. So my, drafts tend, my second drafts tend to be much longer than the first, because rather than cutting for overstating, I think I've been very clever and cleverly buried a plot point. I've buried it so cleverly that no one even got that's what I was trying to talk about. Uh, so the second drafts are longer. I, I have the laborious problem of explaining myself the second time through. And, uh, and, and that's, that's very tedious because it's difficult to be spontaneous when you're trying to do that. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of the process. Does that sound like the process, more or less? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes the play isn't finished, 
until it is actually up and produced and on its feet and fully realized, and sometimes even not then. We go away from a play, Fifth of July being a good example mm -hmm. of this. Uh, I remember when we, when we finally got Fifth of July sort of on its feet, and we had a discussion after the first preview or something, and we sort of asked people, how many people knew you know, what the relationship was between Aunt Sally and, and you know, the kid? Yeah. And we, you know, it was surprising a how third. many people did not a know third. this. You know. So Lanford would write in lines like, uh, um, your, uncle's talking your uncle's talking to you, and then he would say, your mother's talking to you, so that people would know she was his mother and he was the uncle. Anyway, so it was up, it was running, it was a success, it ran for six months at Circle Rep, and Lanford and I were on to another project. We went to Chicago to, to work on a, a, a remounting of Serenading Louis, which is a play that's gone through three or four big major revisions. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, there we were in the lobby of, of the American Academy Festival, the Academy Festival Theater is called in Chicago, and uh, these young kids came to us and said, "Oh, we're working on Fifth of July, and uh, we have this new little company that we started, and and um, my name's John Malkovich, and I'm playing uh, yeah. uh, Kenny. He was, you yeah. know, a teenager virtually. Yeah. We said, "Oh, that's nice. That's, mm -hmm. and uh, it's being directed by David." Schweitzer, I believe, isn't that right? I don't remember. I, yes, I think I, so. I, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, they, they said to a. Uh, they, they My said, name's Gary Sinise, and I'm doing, you know. Right. <laughs> and, and so they, they they said to us, you know, there's this peculiar thing about the play. Uh, Aunt Sally is walking around with this uh, box of chocolates that's got a, uh, Matt's ashes in it, and uh, because of where it occurs in the play, it lets us off the hook, and so we we lose interest. And we think it, it occurred to us that it would be better if you delayed that until after such and such another event. And <coughs> Lanford and I both looked at each other and said, oh my God, they're absolutely, absolutely right. Absolutely right. <laughs> so the minute we finished with our production, I ran back to New York and got the act, called the actors back. I mean, they had been playing for <coughs> two or three months. Yeah. And we said, we want to move this scene you know, to later in the play and blah, blah, blah. And they did it. And uh, it had been published by then. It had, it had been published by then. <laughs> another. A couple, a couple of years went by before we did it on Broadway. Uh, Tally's Folly came along <coughs> in the meantime. We had the chance to do it again at the Mark Taper Forum. We continued to revise the play. And, and if, as a matter of fact, it's interesting about Fifth of July specifically. Uh, if you have the, the hardback version of that, or the, um, the Hill and Wang version, mm -hmm. and compare it to the uh, Broadway version that's published in Dramatist Play Service, Play Service you'll version. see an enormous difference. Completely different. They're, they're the, 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 Eventually, the, the play ended up being a much better play than it, than it was when it was first published. Yeah. So the, the real version of the play is the Dramatist Play Service. Get that and, and read that if, if you're interested the real in the July. The so are... when is a play finished? You know, uh, I'm finished with that one now. Yeah, I think. That, that you know. But it took, for, it took forever, and it was this beautiful book that Hill and Wang produced, but it was no longer valid because I rewrote the play. We, uh, we really have to stop now uh, for the best of all possible reasons, time constraint. Yeah. Oh, great. We have sorry, to, there's no more time. We, ha we, ha we are and out of time. And the second I reason, by now I consider that I have quit smoking. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> you haven't had a... S <laughs> thanks right. for coming out and being such a lively audience yeah, on a rainy uh, lovely, lovely, yes, Saturday lovely. afternoon. Terrific question. Thank you.